job is actually to try to do something today that you guys are going to go away with. And when you come back and stand up here 40 years from now like I am from my time at prep, you will have something to hold on to and spread to the next generation. So it's a complete delight for me to be here and tell you a little bit about the crazy world that I live in but also to teach you something about freedom of expression, which is also the world that I live in. So yeah, so I'm a cartoonist, I'm a political cartoonist. I have published 8,000 cartoons, 140 covers. I've toured the world speaking to groups like this, but tell you what, there's no group that I'd rather be speaking to than you guys here today. <laughs> cartoons a little bit, but I want to start, I got my old friend here, the blank piece of paper, okay, and I wanted to first talk to you a little bit about the first cartoon I remember drawing, which was in uh, fifth grade, Norwalk, Connecticut, hands up, Norwalk, okay, respect, and, um, all right, so, Norwalk, Connecticut, fifth grade, St. Thomas the Apostle School, it's music class. Right? So the nun used to sing with her eyes closed during class. And I'm eyeballing her, and I, I got to get this down on paper. Right? I got to get this down on paper. So she's got this, like, little pug nose like this, okay? Little, her eyes are squeezed shut like this. And she's got the curly hair peeking out from underneath the habit that goes way down like this, right? And then I draw her mouth the size of a battleship, okay? <laughs> like this. <laughs> this kind of thing, right? So I'm drawing this thing pretty much for my own self-edification. I'm just doing it for my own fun. But the girl sitting next to me grabs a hold of it, has a little giggle, passes it to the boy next to her, and soon the cartoon is circulating around the class. And you know what? I'm a star. I'm a star. 12 years old, the pure affirmation is amazing until the nun gets a hold of the cartoon. And she does something that you wouldn't expect to happen today. She takes me by the ear down to the boys' room, and maybe we take a bite out of a bar of soap, okay? And she says, don't you ever draw another cartoon like that again. And I've been doing them ever since. <laughs> ever since. Okay? <laughs> but, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. I had some great teachers here at prep. I had some great teachers here at prep. She was the best teacher I ever had because, as a cartoonist, she taught me some important lessons. First, cartoons are visceral. People respond to them immediately. Number two, for all of us average citizens under the thumb of authority, there's no easier way or better way to take a powerful person and pull them down a notch than to do a caricature. And the third thing I learned is those people on the sharp end of caricature don't always respond the same way as all the citizens do. And I've had that happen over and over again, whether it's politicians or prime ministers or whomever, who probably respond the same way, but they may not be giving me soap. They would rather be doing other things with me. So it's a really interesting thing, this line, the cartoon. When you think of cartoons, you think of laughter, but actually cartooning can be extremely dangerous. And I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about that today. So this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to show you a bunch of slides, giving you a little insight into this world that I've been dealing with. Then I'm going to open the floor for some questions. So if you've got some good questions, make sure you, 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 you file them away and have them ready. And then I'm going to do some drawing, or I'm going to do some of my favorite characters, politicians that I've done over the years. Does it sound good? Sound good? All right. So here I am. This is my early work. Okay, so this is of uh, age six, uh, kindergarten, that's Abraham Lincoln, right? State, you know, the, the Gettysburg Address. Now, this is a very important cartoon, very important cartoon, because in addition to being my first cartoon that we have, it's also inspired a feature-length motion picture starring Daniel Day-Lewis, this particular cartoon, okay? So, here's the thing. At age six, everybody in this room is drawing. But somewhere between age 6 and 16, most people drop off. But drawing actually is embedded in our DNA. 
This notion to try to capture the complex world in lines is something that cavemen have tried to do. The ancient Egyptians, everyone tries to do it. And you look at the sun here, the sun is a circle with lines over it. Everyone knows it's the sun, but the sun doesn't have lines around it. We're trying to capture the world in a way that we can describe with lines. So for me, I am a professional six-year-old. I've been doing this ever since. So after graduating from um, here at Prep, then on to Harvard, I went to the streets of London where I was drawing caricatures of tourists. And one of the things when you're drawing caricatures of people is that you see mountains of faces combined. And every face is different, but all the faces have something in common as well. And you have to learn how to delineate and find the special features. So I started doing caricatures of, 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 of first of tourists, but then got my first job working for The Economist, but now, I was not doing holiday makers, I was doing policy makers, important people, powerful people, like my school teacher. And I was drawing politicians, mostly presidents, but every major politician over the past 35 years around the world I've drawn. But in addition to drawing the major characters, I realized that caricatures tell more than just a rendition of a face. They can also tell a story. And you do many of the important people, like this is, who's this? Anybody? Joe Biden, excellent. You guys are good, you guys are good. Okay, I'll test you again, test you again. But now, <laughs> now I found that I was living abroad as an American, living in the UK, and if you are an American, believe me guys, you live abroad for any time, you are held personally responsible for everything that goes on in this country. And so I had this passion for caricature, passion for cartooning, passion for drawing that started here at Prep. And then I poured in my new interest in politics and decided to be a political cartoonist. And there's this cartoon I did, my most famous cartoon, appeared around the world thousands of times, about the stock market. It's called Just a Normal Day at the Nation's Most Important Financial Institution. There's a guy there on the left, he's saying, I've got a stock here that could really excel. Somebody overhears him and says, really, excel, excel, sell, 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 Carries on at the bottom. Sell, sell, sell. A fellow says, this is madness, I can't take any more. Goodbye, 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 bye, 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 bye. And then the guy at the bottom there says, I got a stock here that could really excel. Okay, so the whole idea that it's this kind of crazy Chinese whispers thing that goes on. Well, cartoon appears, Baltimore Sun, New York Times, Herald Tribune, around the world, next thing happens, I'm getting phone calls from stockbrokers all around the world. And they're saying two things. Number one, they want a copy of the cartoon. Number two, this is exactly how it is. This is what they told me. Which means we should all be very scared. We should be all be very scared. This is what it's really like. A lot of times people say, okay, where do you get your ideas from? How does it work? How does it work being a cartoonist? All right. Well, first of all, because in my job as a political cartoonist, my real job is not necessarily to make you laugh, but my job is to make you think. <laughs> using humor, but using it as a vehicle for a message. And so as a result, I have to be well informed about what's going on. So I'm always listening to the radio, watching the news, ingesting as much information as I possibly can. But once I've got that information in my head, now I've got to find a way to apply it into a cartoon idea. A little potted, quick view of where I have been for the past 40 years. But let me take us back to the beginning, because it started all here. Really started all here. And I was here in 1973. I was class president, played basketball for a very successful team. Not as successful as this year's team, but a good team. And I was the cartoonist for the prep soundings. One of the first things that I did. And, um, but I'll show you here, it all started with this cartoon. I had the very first cartoon that I published ever was here in the prep soundings. And the story was is that McDonald's had just started. This is in 1970, December 1970, first time that it, and it opened up down, down at Fairfield. And guys used to take off at lunchtime in their cars and go down and sneak off campus to go get a bite to eat. And they sent down um, some of the security guys from Fairfield University and, and grabbed the, the, um, the prep guys by the collars and brought them back. And so at the time, 
the, the, uh, the theme, let me go to the next one. So here it is, yes, so Mc, I even spelled McDonald's wrong, so that was really bad. So McDonald's is your kind of place was the actual you know, catch phrase for McDonald's at the time. And my cartoon was this, you know, we have a security guy picking up a prep kid, and the tagline is this, but Officer Berkman's Cafeteria is not my kind of place. And that was where it all started. My career started with this cartoon right here at Prep. So now, uh, today, on this Tuesday, is the 36th anniversary of my first cartoon appearing in The Economist magazine. And, um, and I'm really proud to um, spend this day with you. I'm going to open the floor for some questions. We're going to do some drawing, and then I hope that I'm going to leave you guys with a message that you will not forget. All right? The freedom that I have comes responsibility. So it's really important when I do my cartoons that I'm going to do cartoons that aren't sexist, that aren't racist, cartoons that have value, that elevate the discussion, don't bring the discussion down. They have to be journalistically sound. And so for all those reasons, I have to put an enormous amount of pressure on myself to provide excellence. And also, one of the things about my business is that you're only as good as your last cartoon to a certain degree. Life is changing very fast. And so one of the great things I think about being a cartoonist is, yes, I have a blank piece of paper every day to start anew. But also one of the great challenges in my business is that I've got another 5,000 blank pieces of paper I've got to fill before I retire. I've already done 8,000. So there's an enormous amount of uh, challenge and the freedom that's given to me is also can be a burden, but it's, one that, it's a challenge that I embrace. I love it. I love it. I told you I work on a deadline. Which means that every cartoon I do, I don't finish. I stop it. It's not finished. Give me 10 more minutes, I'll add something. Give me a whole 24 hours to draw it again, I could do it better. So what you have to do is you have to work within those confines to the best possible way you can. Every cartoon I do really is a practice for the next one. The learn lessons that I've learned from all that. But also one of the things that, that has been an interesting thing as far as the way you manage that limitation is the same thing that happens for anybody here who writes, anybody here who paints, anybody here who's an athlete, is this whole notion that you have expectations, you have goals you want to achieve, aspire to. But you're not always going to reach those goals. So what do you do when you don't reach those goals? Do you give up? Or do you fight on? Do you try to pursue and do better tomorrow? And that is the, that is the path to excellence, is managing your expectations. You want high expectations, but you can't always reach them, but you have to aspire to them. And that's what I have to do every single day. Knowing that every time I see a cartoon, I look at it and I go, oh, I wish I just changed that. But then I just gotta push it aside onto tomorrow and go forward. If you had to draw a cartoon of prep, what would you have included in it? Oh man, this guy's gonna try to get me in trouble. <laughs> if I was gonna do a cartoon about prep, what I'd include in it. Okay, well here's the thing is, is that because I told you I research a lot of my cartoons. I would love to, you know, you come here and spend a week, you, you talk to everybody and try to get a sense of where prep is today. But I won't do, I would say this, I'll talk about prep's impression on me, which is a, you know, this is, a, most of the cartoons you deal with are humor and, and they're usually critical, aren't they? But I'm not gonna be critical because I tell you, my experience at prep really gave me an amazing foundation for what I do as a cartoonist. It taught me a few things, justice, compassion, responsibility, determination, camaraderie. And also guys, what you're gonna find is that you're surrounded by a lot of smart guys here, okay? okay not everybody's smart, but a lot of smart guys here. When you go out in the real world, there's not as many, you're, you're, you're amongst an elite crew here. And you're gonna, you're, what you get from your brothers here is something that also carries you on as you move on to life. And you know, I'm still a good friend with many of the people that I knew from back time here because, because of that. So, you, so it, yes, prep gives you an awful lot of strong things, great foundation that really helped lift me as I moved into the international world of, of journalism and politics. When I was a young freshman here, okay, the uh, prep soundings was doing a, uh, a, uh, a parody of uh, what it's like to be a freshman coming into prep. 
And instead of FP, Fairfield Prep, it was Fairfield Pond. Fairfield Pond, FP. And so, and then we come in as tadpoles when you're freshmen, and then you graduate as frogs. So that was a nice, nice, neat metaphor. But we had a uh, dean of men at the time, named uh, Father Dee, I think it was, and I drew him as the dean of frogs. And he was a frog. I drew him as a big frog. And um, he kind of looked like a frog. And, um, and, and it caused, like, when, every, when everyone saw it, their jaws hit the floor. Oh my god, this is crazy. What, what's going to happen? What's going to be the reaction? Okay? And of course, with my personal experience in fifth grade, I was anticipating that large bars of soap were going to be headed my way. Okay? But you know what happened? It was a great lesson for me in democracy. Because the cartoon ran. Sure, it got all the buzz and excitement, and then I, I was scared of running into Father D in the hallway. And when I did, he you know, crossed his arms, and he looked me up and down, and he made me squirm, and then he said, pretty good drawing, Mr. Callagher, and I get to skip the class. And so, the tolerance, the notion of what, um, what goes into something that, like that was a great lesson for me, too. So that was the one part, and I used to draw teachers in class, too. <laughs> Guys, when you're writing or doing anything, you have to know who your audience is, what knowledge they have. So when I do a cartoon for the Baltimore Sun, and I'm doing a cartoon about the Ukraine, I'm going to assume that they don't know anything about Ukraine. So the cartoon may require a little bit of explanation. When I do a cartoon for The Economist, they know everything about Ukraine. You can do a more sophisticated approach to the subject accordingly. The second thing I do is I always think about what is the important thing to be said here, not what is funny about this. What is important to say? And that's kind of where I start. And then the final thing is that after I've established my point of view, now I start looking for what I call the seam of a story. That tender little area where incongruity breaks in and where, where nonsense takes place. And then I start to have an internal debate in my brain between the left and right side of my brain firing ideas back and forth. So that's kind of a rough take on it. I'm going to do a little bit of drawing here. I'm going to draw some of my favorite people I've drawn over the years. Now as you see, these drawings that, I, that you saw here, they take a little time. They kind of take me like all day to do. Um, those black and white drawings, you say, well, I use 100-year-old pen nibs. Dip it in a bottle of ink, scratch, scratch, scratch. It takes me three hours alone to apply the ink to the paper. It takes a long time. The pencil sketches before that will be a couple of hours because I'm reworking and I'm re uh, building on the composition, trying to make something that you are going to read in five seconds. I spend eight hours to, 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 to build it so it's a delightful experience in the time. But the sketches I'm going to do now, I can whip these things off because I've drawn these guys hundreds of times. But when I'm at home and I'm gonna draw Barack Obama, who I have drawn, who, believe me guys, I look at Barack Obama's face more than I look at my own face, okay? That I still have photographs of him on my screen when I'm drawing, because it really helps conjure the individual when you're, when you're drawing them. But these guys I've done kind of quickly, and it kind of helps. So let me, let me start with Al Gore. Okay, Al Gore. You guys know Al Gore, right? Okay. So Al Gore. And I like Al Gore. I've seen him in person. And he's got a funny shaped head. His, shape, his head of shape is kind of like this. Okay? So I got to tell you guys, the, the most recognizable feature that everybody in this room has is the shape of your head. It's the reason why you can recognize somebody from a long distance, even though you can't necessarily define the individual features. And it's the reason why you can recognize somebody from behind. All right, so Al Gore's got this kind of funny shaped head. He's got this kind of black greaser hairdo kind of thing that goes like this. He's got ears that's, that are like Spock from Star Trek. You remember they stick, they're actually like glued to the bottom of his skull here, okay? He's got long, straight, bony nose, flared nostrils, kind of like this, right? And he's got Elvis lips, like, oh yeah, let's do it. All right, like this. Uh, and already you can start to see him appear a little bit on the page. But here's the funny thing about Al Gore. Now, many people think 
that the 2000 election campaign was lost by a few hundred votes in Florida, okay, between Al Gore and George W. Bush. But I tell you what, I've seen him up close, it's not that. He lost, Al Gore lost the election because Al Gore has got the eyes of death. The eyes of death. That's what he looks like, okay? When you see him up close, this is what Al Gore looks like. So there we go. Anyways. Okay, Al Gore, Al Gore. Right? Let's pass that one over there to you. Okay. All right, so John Kerry. Long face, long face. Here we go. All right, so he's got a long neck. He's got a long face. He's got a long face. He's got a long face. And you know what? I don't think that's it. I don't think that's right. Well, let's see here. Okay, that's better. Okay, he's got a long face. There we go. And his nose comes from like this, and his eyes have to go like this. And then he's got the hair that goes like this. Goes like this, bang, bang. There you go. Wait, John Kerry, what do you think? John Kerry! Yeah. John Kerry, there we go. Embody the person when I'm drawing, so I start talking like Bill Clinton. When I'm drawing him, so I apologize in advance if I start to mumble. And he, um, Bill Clinton, I don't know, he's a kind of like this. And uh, the nose, they feel like you've squeezed it, you have to go honk. <laughs> Um, he's got a little, um, a little bunny rabbit teeth like this, and the cheeks are kind of round like that. And then the eyes with, oh, poor Bill. He was at the basketball game last night, and he's got so many bags in his eyes. Which is a problem, because he travels so much, and they charge for every bag these days. It's terrible, okay. <laughs> And there we go, I think. What do you think, Bill Clinton? I like it. Bill Clinton. About a man, about a boy. All right. When a politician first comes on the scene, the first caricatures are very similar to photographs. But over time, the caricatures get more and more exaggerated, partly because you guys become more familiar with the guy's face, but also the cartoonists do when they pull him out. So I'm going to show first George H.W. Bush when he took office, and then what he looked like four years later. Okay. So at first, he had this kind of, yeah, this is going to be also be a profile, kind of unsensational hair, that's at the back of his head here, like this. He had kind of a, a, a big forehead, like this, curls in like this, a nose, sharp nose, like this. He had a mouth, an upper mouth, the kind of little scrawny teeth, down like this, okay? And then his chin went like this, his ears were kind of very modest. I mean, he really looked like an insurance salesman. Here's his glasses. You know, he really, there was nothing particularly distinguishing of him at the time, okay? So that was the first thing. Oh, whoa, boy. Uh, that's not a political statement. No, okay. Uh, so let's, let's see what it looked like four years later. Okay, here we go. Thank you. All right, four years later. All right, his hair is saying up here. But then the back of his head got this kind of light bulb thing going on like this, okay? The back of his hair was like this. His ears were sticking out the back. He had this long, sharp nose like this. His eyes were slanting down like this. He had this upper mouth like a beak. And his little teeth were wah, back down like this. And then his chin went way out like this. Oh my gosh. And the glasses were perched at the end of his nose like this. And so that's what he looked like four years later. I mean, isn't that crazy? But it's true. That's George H.W. Bush. H.W. Bush. All right. George W. Bush was God's gift to cartoons. <laughs> he, he uh, first of all, is kind of problematic for me because we need two more pieces of paper, one for each ear. Okay, here. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to put it sideways to see if that's going to help me a little bit. Okay. So, um... He was an interesting guy to draw. So his nose, I'm going to start with the middle of his nose. Very flared nostrils here like this. You guys have a hard time seeing over there, aren't you? Um, set up parentheses like this. This is like a seagull, right? A seagull going up and across like this in his upper. This is his teeth down here. Uh -huh. Chin like a W. This is a chin like a W. Um, little tiny eyes, little tiny eyes, like that. 
Okay? Then we have this very heavy brow here, a heavy brow going up like this. And then we're going to feel a lot. Now that we know, the problem is we don't have enough room for his ear, so we do the best we can. Look at that. Okay, one ear here, one here. We probably just leave it like that almost. That's pretty good. But we're going to connect it down here like this. Line here, line here, line here, these lines here, and already look, he's starting to appear in front of us. And ladies and gentlemen, George W. Bush! leave you with a parting thought. All right, Barack Obama, Barack Obama. All right, so I've been watching Barack Obama's face for quite a long time. And he's got an interesting face. He's got a handsome face. So I'm going to start with the top of his head. This is going to be a profile. You know, he's got a kind of brown head. His hair, as you know, is getting grayer very fast. You know, it really is taking a lot of weight. Kind of heavy brow. When you want to really get a sense of somebody, you see him at a distance, but in his case, when you see him at a distance, you can often not even see his, his eye because the brow is so heavy. Nose, uh, uh, unspectacular nose, except he's got this little mole right here on his nostril, which you're never going to take your eyes off of now every time you see him. Oh, look at that thing moving right there on his nose. All right. And then he's got that you know, heavy upper mouth like, like this, like this. So you're already, you can start to see if he's appearing. But here's the thing about Barack Obama. Is this this movement you guys have probably heard of called the birther movement, who claimed that he was not born in the United States, was not born on the island of Hawaii. The notion was that if he's not a US citizen, he's an eligible, illegitimate president. So this group has been pushing that agenda for a little while. And I, for a lot of time, I thought it was a load of nonsense. But you know, I've been watching his face for such a long time, I'm beginning to wonder if there's a little bit of truth in that. Because as I see him like this, I'm beginning to think maybe Barack Obama was not born on Hawaii. I think maybe Barack Obama was born on Easter Island. <laughs> what do you think? Thank you very much.